Good afternoon. I'm Abby Wolf, and I have the good fortune of being the executive director of the Hutchins Center. And on behalf of Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. and all of us here, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the W.E.B. Du Bois virtual lecture by Professor Barbara McCaskill titled Black Women's Lives and Labors in Two Movements, The Georgia Fugitive Ellen Craft and Harlem Spectacular Carolyn Stanford Wilkins. And I love that title. <laughs> I can't wait to hear the paper. Um, one very brief housekeeping note, and all of you who have been with us before know this, um, please write your brief questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we will get through as many as we can at the end of the, the lecture in the Q&A segment. It's my pleasure now to say a few words about Barbara McCaskill, Professor of English at the University of Georgia, co-director of the Civil Rights Digital Library Initiative and Associate Academic Director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts. She's the co-editor of Postbellum Pre-Harlem, African-American Literature and Culture, 1877 to 1919, and the author of Love, Liberation, and Escaping Slavery, William and Ellen Craft in Cultural Memory. McCaskill edited and wrote an introduction to the 1860 memoir, Running 1,000 Miles for Freedom, The Escape of William and Ellen Craft from Slavery. Her most recent book is the co-edited volume, The Magnificent Reverend Peter Thomas Stanford, Transatlantic Reformer and Race Man. Her essays have appeared in the Cambridge History of African American Autobiography, The Rutledge Companion to American Literary Journalism, and the Oxford Handbook of the African American Slave Narrative, among many other journals and collections. Professor McCaskill is a member of the editorial boards of the Journal of Transatlantic Studies, Legacy, a Journal of Women Writers, and ESQ. Professor McCaskill has been involved in several digital library initiatives and many award-winning film and archival projects. In 2020, she served as creative producer for the Georgia Incarceration Performance Project, which received an honorable mention for the performance by our hands from the National Council on Public History. Professor McCaskill has received, received numerous grants from institutes, including Radcliffe, the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, the Schomburg Center and our very own W.E.B. Du Bois Institute. We are absolutely delighted to have Professor McCaskill here. It's been a long time coming, pandemic delays and all sorts of things, but we're so glad to be here with us today. And we welcome her along with all of you to the Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll get started. Thank you, Abby, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Dr. Gates, for the invitation to this series, and thank you, Matt, for your wonderful technical support. Thank you all for this opportunity to punctuate Women's History Month with this talk about my research on two extraordinary, if in many ways mysterious, African-American women. I started my career three decades ago when I completed graduate school with a dissertation on 19th century African-American women's slave narratives inspired by a grounding in the black feminist and womanist research of literature scholars and historians, including Frances Smith Foster, Hazel Carby, Rafia Zafar, Akasha Gloria Hull, Dorothy Sterling, Joanne Braxton, and Darlene Clark Hine. I have been blessed and lucky to benefit from the guidance and rigor of the late Elizabeth Fox Genovese, my dissertation advisor, from perspicacious editors such as Nancy Grayson and Walter Biggins, both formerly of the University of Georgia Press, and from Joycelyn Moody, Kathleen Diffley, Sarah Ruffing Robbins, John Lowe, John Ernest, Caroline Gebhard, Rhonda Robinson Thomas, and other colleagues who have critiqued, published, and or encouraged my writing. 
Dr. Henry Louis Gates is important in my history for providing me the opportunity of an initial academic journal publication, which was a book review of Jean Fagan Yellen's groundbreaking edition of Harriet Brent Jacobs 1861 memoir, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl for African American Review, which was then in its final year as Black American Literature Forum. I have read and taught from Dr. Yellen's editions and digital repositories of incidents throughout my career. Her scholarship remains one of my go-to models for synthesizing historical and critical methods, archival research, and compelling storytelling. Finally, I can credit the new directions my research has taken to the undergraduates and graduate students I have taught and mentored at the University of Georgia for these 30 years, whose enthusiasm and curiosity have driven me forward. I am indebted to student collaborators, Ella Anderson, Ayana Arrington, Luke Christie, and Sidonia Serafini of the recently initiated Digital Clinton Project on slavery and freedom in 19th century middle Georgia, and to the decades of students, particularly Christina L. Davis, now Dr. Davis, Lauren Chambers, now Dr. Chambers, Joyellen Freeman, Courtney Thomas, and Aggie Ebrahimi, who journeyed with me down many a Georgia and Florida road in search of stories for the Civil Rights Digital Library. And finally, to the incoming students of the Penn Center National Historic Landmark Summer Residencies, whose work is yet to begin, but nonetheless will be found to be as amazing as the women of my study. My research on African American literature has focused on how American and British newspapers shaped the stories for good and ill of African American figures like Ellen Craft and Carolyn, Beatrice, Mabel, Stanford, Sparrow, Wilkins. From the antebellum decades through those of the early 20th century, and the extent to which the Black subjects of these reports could influence, clap back to, ratify, or deny them. My talk today considers the question of how family members, friends, and other interpersonal relationships may have mediated or informed their public roles as African American women. As Senator Cory Booker remarked to Supreme Court Justice nominee and federal judge Katanji Brown Jackson during last week's confirmation hearings, every black woman is, quote, a person that is so much more than your race and gender, end quote. Ellen Craft and Carolyn Wilkins were so much more than these, but as African-American women of the 19th and early 20th centuries, their realities and inner lives were often stereotyped and distorted so as to flatten and essentialize them in ways that Senator Booker and Judge Brown Jackson have gestured to. Carolyn Wilkins' whole story, like Ellen Craft's, has been elusive to trace in the archives, yet both tested the limitations and stretched the possibilities held out to African-American women in the turn into the 20th century. Ellen Craft's story of self-emancipation with her husband, William, fleeing as a planter, as the caption to their famous memoir's frontispiece reads, escaping bondage disguised as a disabled, affluent Southern white man who counted women, children, and men as property, not people, is one that foregrounds themes of mobility and movement. In his seminal 1978 American Studies essay about the Crafts, Richard R.J.M. Blackett calls their flight from Georgia an odyssey. Its reversals, lucky breaks, black humor and suspense as mesmerizing as those faced by Odysseus and his fellow adventurers of Homer's epic poem. Ellen and William cross from Macon in middle Georgia by the Central and Georgia Railway to the major East Coast port of Savannah, up the coast by steamer from Savannah to Charleston, up by steamer again from Charleston to Delaware, 
than inland by a combination of ferries, carriages, and railroads, such as the Richmond, Fredericksburg, Philadelphia line, through Virginia, Havre de Grace, as Eastern Marylanders pronounce it, and the District of Columbia into free Philadelphia. In research for her forthcoming study, Riding Jane Crow, African American Women on the American Railroad, Miriam Thaggart nuances their journey. She and others such as Clint Schemmer, Jeff Brancom, and Kafia Hosh have intersected the craft's trek with those of other fugitives from slavery, such as Henry Box Brown and John Washington, all used the terminal at a quiet landing to transfer trains from Richmond, Virginia to Washington, DC. Thaggart's scholarship and Elizabeth Storter Pryor's research in her book, Colored Travelers, Mobility and the Fight for Citizenship Before the Civil War, draw through lines between Ellen Craft's crossing of physical borders between slavery and freedom and subsequent generations of black women who disrupted segregated modes of travel and filed lawsuits against railroads and bus companies in order to assert their rights to citizenship and dignified treatment. This emphasis on the craft's mobility also connects them to debates spanning centuries about how movement and travel have and have not defined African Americans as citizens. Their memoir, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, published in 1860 and then reprinted in 1861, traces their movements from their escape first from enslavement in 1848 and then in Boston in 1851 to yeah, a little so, so, uh, It makes like, visible just like in like the what was at stake for African Americans and citizenship in the aftermath of the Supreme Court's March 6, 1857 decision in Dred Scott v. Sanford. The court had ruled that the enslaved Scott, along with his wife Harriet Robinson Scott, who had filed a separate freedom suit, and their daughters were not entitled to be free even though his enslaver, John Emerson, had taken him to live and work in the free state of Illinois and the territories of Wisconsin and Minnesota where he had married Harriet. By extension, according to the court, no African American could ever be treated as a citizen or sue for freedom. The Crafts memoir, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, excoriates the Dred Scott decision as the crowning act quote, of infamous Yankee legislation. The Supreme Court, the highest tribunal of the Republic, composed of nine chosen from both the free and slave states, has decided that no colored person or persons of African extraction can ever become a citizen of the United States. That is to say, in the opinion of the court, robbery, rape, and murder are not crimes when committed by a white upon a colored person. Judges who will sneak from their high and honorable position down into the lowest depths of human depravity and scrape up a decision like this are wholly unworthy of the confidence of any people." End quote. The crafts kept moving over a lifetime, making visible the consequences of such human depravity on actual African Americans. What their memoir and both first and second hand reports in papers and letters consistently omit is what happened during Ellen Craft's earliest years in slavery before she met William as a young adult and how those years may have primed her as a free and very publicly known adult to both resist and recognize limited expectations about her gender and race. The home where she spent her formative years in her birthplace of Clinton, Jones County, Georgia, still stands. A rural bedroom community, which, which around 28,000 people called home in the 2020 census, its neighbor, the city of Macon, is five times larger in population. Yet two centuries ago, Clinton was on the rise. Originally, it was named DeWitt after New York Governor DeWitt Clinton who promoted the construction of the Erie Canal, creating a populous commercial corridor from Albany, hugging New England in the east, 
to Buffalo and the Great Lakes on the state's western side. Like its northern namesake, Clinton had promised to be a consequential lever for the state's mercantile and cultural aspirations. The 1820s and 1830s marked the pinnacle of its influence. It was one of Georgia's major market towns and transportation hubs, along with Macon and Savannah. Founded in 1808, Clinton had attracted veterans of the War of 1812 and their ambitious sons who had migrated from Virginia and North Carolina to erect sedate homes, churches, and a jail arranged in an orderly grid. During the 1820s, when the federal government deported and depopulated the Creek Nation that originally had hunted, farmed, and governed there, it held a lottery that enabled white Americans to acquire land and accelerate the region's growth. The area's fertile fields for cotton, central location in the state, and proximity to the Okmulgee River as a conduit for transporting that cotton and other crops and goods contributed to Clinton's mercurial growth during the 20th century. Those fecund fields had resulted from the labors of the enslaved and from black bodies replenished through the internal slave trade or second middle passage from which Clintonites like the trader Hope Hull Slatter, whose empire of slave markets stretched from Baltimore to New Orleans had amassed fortunes. An advertisement posted by Slatter in the July 11, 1883 Baltimore Sun titled Cash for Negroes touted one of his buildings on Pratt Street, which he described as a large and extensive establishment and private jail to accommodate black people awaiting sail down river to New Orleans. In the approving terms that reflected the cognitive dissonance perpetuated in towns like Clinton between the paternal, fictionalized version of slavery and its brutal and terrible realities. He had designed the building, wrote Pratt, upon the most approved principle with an eye to comfort and convenience. The male and female apartments are completely separate. The rooms for both are large and airy with a firm large yard for exercise with pure, delightful water indoors. Ellen's childhood and early adolescent years suggest that the conditions that fueled her desire to be free, to marry in freedom, to raise free children, and to enact strategies in freedom that alternatively acknowledged and questioned expectations about what kind of woman an African American she would be, all these began in Clinton before she met William in Macon, where together they hatched plans to run away. Her biological father and enslaver, the lawyer James Smith, bought, sold, leased, willed, swapped, and mortgaged African-American bodies like hers and her enslaved mother's, Mariah Smith Butler's, from this one-room office on Madison Street, originally a workspace of the Honorable Richard Johnson, a judge and state representative and currently under restoration for adaptive reuse as a community and educational center. Passing back and forth between this office and the big house with messages or meals, Ellen would have witnessed how casually black families were divided and as William would say, knocked down to new enslavers. How quickly the bonds of maternal affection and brotherly and sisterly love among black people were dismissed for material gain. In her award-winning history, Medical Apartheid, Harriet A. Washington discusses a man once affectionately known as the father of gynecology, Montgomery, Alabama's Dr. James Marion Sims. He contributed to the development of the speculum and other medical breakthroughs by subjecting enslaved women against their will and without painkillers to horrific examinations and surgeries. A recently erected statue by Michelle Bowder commemorating three of these enslaved women, Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy, is titled Mothers of Gynecology 
and offers a counter narrative to a history that has sanitized Sims' legacy. Clinton George's own version of Dr. Sims, Dr. Thomas Hamilton, had contributed to the town Sheen as an educational mecca. He owned the property on which stood this office of Ellen's enslaver, James Smith. Yet a formerly enslaved man who self-emancipated and fled to England, who renamed himself John Brown after the famous abolitionists, exposed the sadistic experiments of Smith's medical colleague in his 1855 narrative, Slave Life in Georgia. To test different remedies for heat stroke, Brown wrote, Dr. Hamilton ordered a hole to be dug in the ground, three feet and a half deep by three feet long and two feet and a half wide. Into this pit, a quantity of dried red oak bark was cast and fire set to it. It was allowed to burn until the pit became heated like an oven when the embers were taken out. A plank was then put across the bottom of the pit and on that a stool. Having tested with a thermometer the degree to which the pit was heated, the doctor bade me strip and get in, which I did, only my head being above the ground. He then gave me some medicine which he had prepared, and as soon as I was on the stool, a number of wet blankets were fastened over the hole and scatling, which are boards of lumber, laid across them. This was to keep in the heat. It soon began to tell upon me, but though I tried hard to keep up against its effects, in about half an hour, I fainted. I was then lifted out and revived, the doctor taking a note of the degree of heat when I left the pit. And the upshot of this experiment, as the second paragraph in the slide tells us, is that Dr. Hamilton was able to develop a pill that allegedly prevented sunstroke if one took that pill with a very piping hot cup of cayenne tea. And according to uh, accounts from the Clinton, Georgia archives, Hamilton made a lot of money from this cure. In addition to such dehumanizing terrors that profited enslavers, Clinton also exposed persons like Ellen Kraft to pathways to liberation. She fled from bondage knowing as running a thousand miles for freedom states, little more than how to recognize the letters of the alphabet. Yet all around her in Clinton were models of how literacy and education could expand life's prospects, albeit for white persons. In addition to a school for young white men, the Clinton Female Seminary was so widely regarded that it attracted pupils from around the region. Its popular headmaster, Reverend Thomas Bog Slade, helped initiate Macon's Wesleyan College, the first chartered college to grant degrees to women. James Smith had been an early member, as this advertisement indicates, of the female seminary's trustees. He also momentarily chaired them, as this advertisement for a teacher from the May 11, 1835 Milledgeville, Georgia Journal attests by listing him as PM or presiding master. In proximity and at service to her white half brother James and white half sister Eliza as they attended to their schoolwork and from their overheard conversations about the seminary, Ellen would have imbibed the message that literacy and education could open channels to power and agency. While we do not know if she had met Michael Healy, an Irish Catholic planter, her mother's sister belonged to this local household. Ellen would have learned the story, still legendary in Clinton, that Healy fell in love with a woman named Eliza that he enslaved. They had born six children together, three of whom he sent to New York schools by the time he wrote his will in 1850, and in it, he emancipated them all. And in it, I would add, he calls Eliza his trusty woman. The example of Michael and Eliza would have underscored to Ellen that sail away from loved ones or a lifetime of uncompensated labor were not necessarily the only options that her future could hold. 
Perhaps they would have encouraged her to remain vigilant for pathways to liberation and to take advantage of them. Once free, during the second half of the century, Ellen's public representations would exemplify her success at what the journalist Moncure Conway in an October 29, 1864 letter called, quote, the improvability of the African race. Even as all of these qualities, her desire for a safe home, freeborn children, literacy, had already been nourished by both positive and negative human connections in slavery. The story of Carolyn Beatrice Mabel Stanford Sparrow Wilkins also begins in slavery, not through lived experience like Ellen's, but indirectly by ancestry and by blood. As I have written in my 2020 book with Sidonia Serafini, you can see the cover here, the magnificent Reverend Peter Thomas Stanford, transatlantic reformer and race man. Carolyn's father, said Reverend Peter Thomas Stanford, was what Hazel V. Carby and Henry Louis Gates have described as a race man, or at least that's what he aspired to become. A black man whose comportment and dress embodied the dignity, self-regulation, pride and discipline of all of his fellow African-Americans whose talents were of service to his people and who mind, whose mind was nevertheless alert to being judged the representative of all black people and sensitive to the harm that could ensue to his community if he let them down. Born and slaved in Hampton, Virginia, not far from where the white lion brought Africans in 1619 to the new world, Stanford lived a peripatetic childhood worthy of an 18th century picaresque novel in the United States, Canada, and England. When he returned to the United States in 1895 from having spent eight years in England, where he became the city of Birmingham's first black pastor, it was with his infant daughter, Carolyn, and his English wife, Beatrice Mabel Stickley, from whom Carolyn took her middle names. His return, which coincided with the death of the celebrated abolitionist and statesman Frederick Douglass, fortuitously seemed to suggest his own ascendance in the pantheon of black activists, such as the craft's old friend, the Liberian missionary Reverend Alexander Crummel, and the anti-lynching activist Ida Wells Barnett. In Cambridge, Stanford published three editions of a textbook, The Tragedy of the Negro in America, and he founded a home for destitute and single girls and young women. Ever outspoken against the lynching and racial violence that had quickly engulfed the post-Reconstruction South, Stanford opened an orphanage and school in his ever-expanding home on Dudley Street in North Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he rotated through several names for it, the Union Industrial Mission and Strangers Home, the New England Aid and Protective Association for Friendless Colored Children, and finally, the Protective Association for Indigent Colored Women and Girls. He enlisted Carolyn, whose mother had died, church members and friends, into especially offering shelter to Southern Black women. And you can see Carolyn in the lower right of this advertisement for their home for orphaned women and girls. Yet his star, rather than continuing to burn brightly and to climb unimpeded to ever greater heights, glowed irregularly, diminished in warmth, and finally quietly dimmed. The ending that met Carolyn at first glance seems more similar to that of a doomed romantic heroine than the celebrity and cosmopolitan that her predecessor Ellen Craft became. Carolyn's remains rest in the Mount Olivet Cemetery in New York, in many ways a world away from the working class North Cambridge, Massachusetts neighborhood of her childhood. Succumbing to tuberculosis at age 40, Carolyn died in penury without heirs, relying on the kindnesses of friends for a roof over her head as she lay dying and on their tenderly proffered comforts and ministrations. Her husband is buried in Mount Olivet as well, but paradoxically not beside her. His resting place is in another part of the cemetery. Where his was a quick, sudden public demise, one mourned by thousands, Carolyn's 
was protracted, anticipated, and private. Her transition from life to death was met by a smaller yet significant group of 200 friends and strangers who braved blustery November winds to trek to her graveside and bid her their final goodbyes. In life, ironically, Carolyn had seized on the strategy of marrying out of obscurity and up into respectability, affluence and influence as a pathway beyond the predictable, safe, unassuming roles that awaited her. In the household of her father, a minister, writer, and educator, her female role models included teachers, church mothers, and sisters, and single black women up from the South, employed as domestics, cooks, laundresses, or caretakers, all who gravitated to his missions and whose services may have been in demand by the workers at the brick factory in their neighborhood. Carolyn could have pursued a respectable ambition of becoming a pious wife and mother or play church piano, which she apparently did for her father's services with much approval from his congregants. Or in keeping with Reverend Stanford's admiration for black women writers and speakers, such as Ida Wells Barnett and Harriet Tubman, and with the public conversations about women's roles and black citizenship launched by club women such as Victoria Earl Matthews, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin and Pauline Hopkins, Carolyn could have become curious about following in their footsteps and those of an early generation of black women, speakers, elocutionists and evangelists. Yet perhaps for reasons of temperament or perhaps because of both temperament and as we shall see, the racialized and gendered standards and stereotypes she faced, Carolyn's debut outside of her father's house occurred in the context of marriage. Her first marriage in 1910 to the custom tailor and haberdasher William Sparrow, as the 1913 who's who of the colored race described him, was by public accounts seemingly out of the blue. A member of the Elks and Oddfellows, the Methodists and the Masons, Sparrow might have had another agenda that complicated his love for Carolyn. He might have surmised that his standing among the black elites in Boston, in the Boston, the black elites in Boston that he admired could skyrocket because of his link to her. The good Reverend Stanford, who had died before their marriage, had also relentlessly sought the public eye and had been a notorious name dropper. As Michelle Taylor Sherwin and I have recently written for the Redex Report blog, Reverend Stanford trumpeted his actual associations with and high regard by local movers and shakers, such as the Boston Guardian newspaper editor, William Monroe Trotter, and on a global stage, Reverend Stanford had not been averse to inflating his ties to public figures, ranging from Frederick Douglass and Harriet Beecher Stowe to the Queen of England and the Prince of Wales. And here in a list of endorsers on the right-hand side of the slide from one of Stanford's early publications, The Plea of the Ex-Slaves Now in Canada, you can see him shouting out to people like the Queen of England and the Prince of Wales. And Sparrow seemed uh, to uh, similarly be interested in social mobility and being seen and known among people of high status and class. Carolyn Williams' marriage flamed out 10 years after it had kindled. A few years before their divorce in 1920, the resourceful Carolyn already was pivoting from housewife to working woman. In a June column, call, column in 1919 called The Limelight for the African-American readers of Half Century Magazine for the Colored Homemaker, associate editor Howard A. Phelps reported that Carolyn had attained credentials in nursing, a socially acceptable employment for American women in this first half of the 20th century. As Darlene Clark Hine demonstrates in Black Women in Nursing, this profession was one of the more remunerative, dignified, and stable points of entry for African American women in the workforce. Phelps explained Stanford's decision to become a nurse not as a means to increase the family income or to land solo on her feet, as they may have been, but as a patriotic response 
to the post-traumatic illnesses of World War I veterans, one that reveals her part in rescuing the minds of many who felt the war so severely. He writes, quote, Miss Sparrow graduated as a specialist in psychopathic nursing from the Chicago State Hospital in 1917. To her credit rests the honor of being the first and only colored graduate in that difficult branch of nursing in the history of the state. Carolyn, he elaborates, was second in a class of 14, 10th in her competitive exam for a position at the Cook County, Illinois Hospital out of 135 applicants, and appointed charge nurse of the tuberculosis ward and emergency service. On the other hand, the Pittsburgh Courier stated bluntly, Carolyn passed for white as a nursing student. Irene Redfield of Nella Larson's 1929 novel, Passing, when it proved convenient, would slip undetected into shops and restaurants as a white woman, but return home then to her African-American neighborhood husband and children. Caroline's decision may have likewise been momentary and self-serving. And she never spoke publicly about feelings of guilt or portrayal that may have haunted her. Throughout her short, sharp adult life, she would approach privacy and celebrity, respectability and unconventionality, not as opposites, but as pairings more attuned to the zeitgeist of her century than her generation may have cared to admit. Second marriage in 1921, 11 years after her first, again seemed to enlarge her choices in life. And instead of a passing mention in the papers, she was soon a fixture in it. In the Pittsburgh Courier and other mainstays of the national black press, the Chicago Defender, Baltimore's Afro-American, the New York Amsterdam News, the headlines were bolder, photographs bigger, and the innuendo and slander even more brazen than that of a decade earlier. And now Carolyn had landed in the thick of it, swaddled in satin dresses and plumped in fox stoles, reclined against fancy automobiles, her confident gaze challenging the camera. The Pittsburgh Courier gushed, quote, her clothes, motor cars, and homes were the talk of the East. End quote. Carolyn had moved on up from nurse to sparkling socialite bride of Baron DeWare Wilkins, one of Harlem's most notorious gangsters. Like Fifth Avenue's Empire State Building, 42nd Street Chrysler Building, and other architectural emblems in the 30s of the city's wealth and swagger, Wilkins Kingdom north of 125th Street encompassed an eclectic assortment of minor league baseball teams, real estate investments and nightclubs that gave the jazz singer and dancer Brick Top and the jazz trumpeter Valeta Snow their first national exposure. And that created an international audience which paved the way for venues like the Cotton Club and Small's Paradise that would later dominate New York nightlife. Public Enemy, Little Caesar, Scarface. Along with the nightlife of the late 20s and 30s, these films helped shape the idea of the American gangster that made actors James Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, and Paul Mooney household names. For those whose immigrant histories, non-white identities, or political and religious affinities required access to the American dream by irregular and unconventional roots, these men held out greed, corruption, strong arming, and survival of the fittest as antonyms to hard work, honesty, discipline, and compassion. But it was not supposed to be the underworld codes of films like The Public Enemy, Little Caesar, Scarface, or the crime syndicates of early 20th century gangsters that captured a woman like Carolyn's imagination. Hers was also the era of the New Negro Renaissance, 
the burst of experimentation and innovation in black art, literature, culture, and self-representation that questioned old modes of respectability and assimilation and renewed the collective demands black people had made since enslavement for the full rights of citizenship, including access to the ballot and admission to schools. Henry Louis Gates has discussed how the history of the idea of the new Negro evolved from its late 19th and early 20th century identifications of African American intellectuals who valued education, wealth, property ownership, respectability, assertiveness, and racial consciousness, who wanted to forget slavery's past and demand citizenship, to a post-World War I generation that toggled between prioritizing political militancy or focusing on literature or culture or art. Carolyn seemed to evoke the tensions of the interwar generation by gravitating between a louche self-indulgent lifestyle and the old school focus on representing and serving the race. She resided conspicuously above one of Wilkins clubs at 134th and 7th Street in an apartment building he bought and named for her, he called the building the Carolyn Apartments, in what a September 13, 1934 Pittsburgh Courier report deemed, quote, a luxurious apartment evocative of the interior of a sultan's harem, graced by oriental rugs, velvet tapestries, silk, satin draperies, the soft patter of Carolyn's slippered feet, the fragrance of her lovely body. Baron Wilkins frowned upon her dining or partying in the, in the nightclubs he owned, which helped beat back speculation that she was as decadent as he was. Her absence at his orders from their nightlife milieu also gave anyone who took a liking to her room to blame their exaggerated trappings of wealth and consumption, and perhaps even their childlessness on Barron's influence rather than Carolyn's. Carolyn had been raised as a modest, selfless, maternal protector of orphans and a minister's daughter. Carolyn and Barron counterbalance Barron's questionable associations and their conspicuous consumption with performances of respectability and civic mindedness. They held soirees and social functions in their uptown apartment for Harlem's African American elites, the 400 as they were known, educators, doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, athletes, entertainers, writers. And the 400 reciprocated, inviting Carolyn to apply her nurse's expertise to their philanthropic projects, such as establishing more beds and wards for African-American patients at the Edgecombe Tuberculosis Sanitarium, projects that aligned with the civic duties and community works of like-minded race men and women. One of the few inconsistencies that appeared in their project to counterbalance the criminality that sullied, sullied Baron Wilkins' name was Carolyn's penchant for motoring solo and very, very fast in the couple's expensive McFarland, up and down the Catskills or along New Jersey back roads. This independence and daring would have likely earned cheers rather than censure from the fans and reporters her, who championed her in the press. In the films that captivated moviegoers of Barron's and Carolyn's generation between the world wars, the gangster faced a limited range of endings to his story. His sins would be squared and his missteps punished by a prison sentence, state-sanctioned execution, or a gangland-style massacre with its soundtrack of bullets, skidding tires, and screams of passers-by gunned down in the crossfire. His girlfriend would end up bitter and alone, disowned by her family for her shameful, immoral decisions, and left with little choice but to prostitute her body or to sink into the drudgery and dullness of a low-wage job in a boarding house room. In a sequence of all of these, where life seemed to imitate art, the house lights flicked on and the curtains descended on the Barolin and Carolyn show. 
A man named Charleston Yellow, otherwise known as the petty criminal William Julius Miller, had held a long-standing grudge against Barron. He exacted his revenge by dispatching Barron as Barron exited the club below their famed apartment. In other words, Yellow killed uh, Barron in a range of gunfire. After New York State prosecutors had their say, Charleston was a dead man walking, condemned to death by Sing Sing's old Sparky, his fellow prisoner's term for the electric chair. Afterwards, Carolyn, never regaining her Harlem glory days, survived as best she could by stretching or selling the remnants of her husband's estate and taking on genteel employments until she finally succumbed to the tuberculosis that had haunted her, the very disease she had treated in patients at Chicago City Hospital as charge nurse of the tuberculosis ward and emergency service. Her death indicates how difficult it had been, it had been to mesh the understated, tasteful pursuits of an upper-class Harlem woman with a desire to live out loud, transgressing conventions in her behavior and in her companions. To nuance this understanding, we can return to the end of her childhood in North Cambridge, to when her father had died and orphaned her after a protracted and undisclosed illness. Between losing Reverend Stanford, her father, and marrying William Sparrow, Carolyn experienced firsthand the vulnerability and predation that many single black women who had fled the South and arrived on the Stanford's doorstep had endured or escaped. Carolyn too had been assaulted, the alleged perpetrator, a white man. Like Ellen Craft, Carolyn had fought back. She had braved the double standard that would have blamed her for the assault by taking the alleged assailant to court. And even though her charges went nowhere, by exposing the reality that no amount or quality of respectability, morality, class, status, or educational attainment could ensure a black woman's dignity and safety. Both Ellen Craft and Carolyn Stanford tested the limits between blackness and whiteness, compliance and resistance, according to what their lives required or what they willed and desired. They were more than their race and gender and willing to press beyond the expectations held about each, even if the rest of the world was too reluctant to keep up with them. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing now <laughs> and uh, take questions. Fabulous, man, that was amazing. That was great. All Thank kind you. of, all I kind like of to stuff tell that, stories. <laughs> yeah, you're a great storyteller. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I appear to be frozen on my own screen. Okay. You're fine. Oh, yeah? That is so weird. Anyway, I never heard of these people. Well, come on. You must have heard of Ellen Craft. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm talking but about Carolyn, no. No, I'm talking, and, I'm talking about the new Negroes. <laughs> yes, okay, yes, well, neither had I, and we actually, and by we, I mean my collaborator on the book about Reverend Stanford and uh, former, soon to be former graduate student, she's defending in two weeks. Uh, uh -huh. Donnie and I had been working tirelessly to piece together Reverend Stanford's story, and during a snow day, literally a snow day, literally in 2018, I stumbled across this announcement about Carolyn Stanford being a nurse. Mm -hmm. I wondered if it was the same Carolyn Stanford, because as you know, when you do this kind of research, you never assume, you just never assume. No, it's true. Homophones, you know? Pardon? Yes, exactly. And then, yeah. of course, I, I can't begin to tell you how crazy it was to find information about Carolyn Stanford, because as you know, Carolyn is spelled in multiple ways, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Diane Carolyn, which is her name, 
and the I-N-E, Carolyn, and half the time the press didn't care how they spelled her name. <laughs> that was another uh, long story. And in fact, in the, if I know it, it was probably too fleeting to see, but in the article from the Boston Globe that I showed, showing her father's mission for women and orphans, their name right. is misspelled, their surname is misspelled. So- Oh yeah, but we had that's gone very through, common. Yes, you. this is one of the uh, lessons that we teach our graduate students and advanced undergraduate students in doing archival research. You need to think about the permutations of a person's name and when you're working through databases or going to research libraries, you have to look up that name every way you can think of spelling it. Yeah, we called it a To make a, a long story pattern. short, uh -huh. that's how we stumbled upon uh, Carolyn. Mm. Stumbled upon that notice uh, about her in the Half Century magazine and mm -hmm. one thing led to another. And I tell you, for 48 hours, neither Sidonia and I were asleep. We were literally on our... <laughs> going through, thank you, Redux, thank you, ProQuest, going through uh, uh, newspaper uh, databases. And when we didn't have the database, I need to give a shout out to the folks at Redux. Uh, when we didn't have a, a database, we, we, we would push forward, as did Ellen Craft and Carolyn in their lives, and, and reach out and say, we need to look at this database. Our institution doesn't subscribe to it. How can we help? And they were awesome, awesome about, once they heard about the research we were doing, awesome about giving us temporary access. Oh, um, that's great. That's yes. wonderful. Yeah. The, um, yeah, we call it sound, using the Soundex for the census. Mm -hmm. um, take the name, like Jeffrey Canada, I did his family tree on finding your roots, but his ancestors, pe people forget that it, the uh, census taker had total discretion over your name and spelling your race. You could tell yes. me whatever you wanted and it was the census taker who decided. But he is uh, Kennedy, Canada, Canada, and, I hear uh, you. and some other kind of spelling, you know, from 1880, 1890. And it's the same family with living in the same house. So the, I'm doing my own. I'm doing my own uh, family genealogy, since I will never be asked to be on your show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not famous enough, and since I've worked on so many um, African American figures, my family members keep asking me, "Well, when are you going to finally use that 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 talent and skill to to learn more about?" You us? should do it. You should do and, it. And one, it's 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 both amazing and disheartening to look at the census uh, reports taken in the South uh, regarding African-Americans because the amount of misspelling, the amount of incorrect addresses, the amount of incorrect uh, employments attributed to black people is staggering to the point that you have to understand that it's deliberate, it's intentional. Well, uh, also, you didn't have to have a piece. tired census takers. We're talking about people that are intentionally showing uh, that these people have a second class status by not bothering to get it right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And but also you didn't have to have a Ph.D. to be a census taker. Right. <laughs> I mean, good point. There were some people who had minimum education there. So themselves. But anyway, it's great. I, um, you know, we are part of the theory generation, but. I keep telling our graduate students that there's gold in the archives. There's so yes. much waiting to be discovered. You could just do a dissertation on one year in the life of any one of these periodicals and redefine the field, you know, it just and make a career for yourself. Uh, you don't have to do one more dazzling close reading of Their Eyes Were Watching God, as important as that is, you know. Yes. Go back to, go back there are many different ways to be a scholar and some. Yeah that we, we take great pride in here at the University of Georgia in our English department is the amount of effort and time and collaboration that we uh, 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 create with archivists and librarians, both at our school and elsewhere, so that the students, the next generation of scholars, learn to read the archives. Because in that way, we can try more closely to get the stories of African Americans right go to the source instead of repeating what we've read 
which may or may not have been right in the first place. And you and I both know, you and I and Abby both, we all know that there have been notorious <laughs> examples of getting it wrong in African-American studies because as scholars haven't gone to the source. We've relied on material that sounds authoritative, but at closer look is not necessarily grounded in historical record or document. No, and, and, and then we repeat, we, we repeat, we repeat the errors footnote to footnote, right? Exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. The only downside that I, I stay up late at night worrying about is that as a field, do we reward and honor that kind of archival research to the extent Enough. that we, we, we reward and honor the theory or even the close readings? Yeah, the answer is no. It's no, but we because have to, it takes so long, right? Yeah, yeah. and it's, uh, it doesn't seem glamorous. But on the other hand, look at my friend, Jeffrey Stewart, who was a graduate student at Yale when I was still a graduate student at Cambridge, but I came back to Yale and I took Charles Davis's course on Afro-American literature. That was my first you know, graduate seminar on Afro-American literature. God knows they weren't teaching it in England. Jeffrey spent 40 years writing that biography of Alain Locke, which won every prize available, including yes. the Pulitzer Prize. So, you know, there's, it's a different kind of um, payoff. But, but more and more, certainly in our English department and in Afro-Am, we are rewarding archival work. And, you know, I have all kinds of archival projects because I love the yes. archive. And yes. By the way, did you do, have you uh, submitted, um, have you written entries for our African-American national biography on all these people? Oh, sure. There was a period in the 90s. I think I wrote four or five of them. Yeah. Uh, but not, you know, the... Actually, I don't know if there is an entry on Stanford. I yeah. suspect there may be. I don't think we wrote it. He's been on many historians' radar, of course. Well, check it. And I'll if you, check it uh, out. If, if it needs to be expanded, you can do that or just drop me a note, you know. Okay. Any I'm, of those people. I might outsource it. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's all right. I have enough but, on uh, my plate. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, it's great for graduate students. Yes. I'm a, you know, we run the agency Founders of Lost Negroes, you know. <laughs> Actually, the person that needs an entry I more and more is not uh, Stanford, because I'm pretty sure he is in your 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 biography. I think it's Carolyn. She yeah, I was thinking of Carolyn. Yes, she needs yeah, well, the entry. Well, would you check and see? I will. I, I don't think there is one. Maybe Sidoni and I, she's taking a new job. Once she gets settled, we can write that. It wouldn't be a problem. Uh, just uh, drop me a note and you will, we will give it to you. Abby, questions, yeah. comments. Great job, Barbara. I love it. The, Thank uh, you. The editor of the executive editor of the African American National Biography is on this. <laughs> he's, he's in the audience and he says there is an entry on the father. Stanford, yes. But yes. not on the mother. But yes, I mean, oh, definitely yes. let's take a look and see what's there because it seems like whether you we don't know very much him. about his mother. Yeah. There yeah. isn't. There isn't a. There isn't a substantive record as far as we can see. But Carolyn, um, please tell the editor if he might contact me. Mm -hmm. uh, my email is of course out there, okay. and we'll talk about Sidoni and I doing work on. Absolutely, Carolyn, because it is a collaboration. He says he'll be in touch. So yeah, he's oh, Stephen that's Niven. Easy. You remember, that's really you remember, easy. You remember so. Stephen Niven. Yes. yes, I will. Okay. I, will, I will see what we can do. Yeah. Other that questions or comments. That was fantastic. So I, um, I have the good fortune of getting the questions and sharing them with you from the audience. But, um, but I just wanted to say that was your conversation together was wonderful, and I think that your, I feel I want to take a class with you. I just. It's obvious that you, you better know. hurry up because my the clock is <laughs> no, but I mean, just even we were talking the, before right. this about time going by. Right. I mean, I'm not I'm gonna be here forever, <laughs> but just the pride that you take in saying your student is dissert is defending her dissertation. I mean, it's it, you can feel it. So, um, thank you for that on behalf of all, all former grad students and current grad students. Thank you for that, but um, so. Um, Cheryl Townsend Jilks is in the audience and she asks the question that I think many of us are wondering, 
When do you think that either of these stories will be turned into movie screenplays? <laughs> Uh, there's quite a lot of action. I can't go into details. There's quite a lot of action. And I think there always will be around Ellen Craft and William Craft. Uh, most recently, there was a segment about the crafts in, well, based on the crafts in the Underground Railroad uh, series that was streaming. And actually, uh, I did an interview for that series. There's a companion podcast series connected to the Ground Railroad in. I was in that interview along with Peggy Priestley, who is one of the uh, descendants of the crafts. I know there is a descendant of the crafts who is working on a film about the crafts. So uh, the crafts are eminently uh, cinematic. Uh, yeah. what, what I realized doing this research about Carolyn Stanford and Baron Wilkins is that they are eminently eminently cinematic too mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not only because of the connections to the emerging gangster genre that baron is clearly playing into but also because of their vivid uh uh public selves uh they were not neither neither one of them were wallflowers uh even though carolyn was pushed back from being very involved in the lush life the nightlife she made sure that wherever she went, she made an entrance. She loved being photographed. She courted, she courted the tabloids. Um, there's a wonderful picture in our book showing her reclined against an automobile. It just wouldn't translate well into the slides. Mm -hmm. when I didn't copy it, uh, but she is uh, uh, beautiful and young and fascinating to 1920s and 30s African-American audiences because of the sheen of Europe on her. Uh, there's a story about her in which she actually uh, plays up her English connection. Her mother is English and she was not averse to reminding people uh, that she was not only biracial, but also bicultural. Hmm. And there's a story that we tell in our book about her motoring in the mountains one day and coming across an English couple whose uh, car had broken down. And she made an immediate connection uh, with the couple because of her roots. And they were charmed by her. They invited her to their uh, home. They were affluent. And the papers picked up the story and they ran with it. Hmm. Uh, so who knows? One day, perhaps there will be a film about uh, Carolyn mm -hmm. well, and her father, who's another story so mm -hmm. all together, he's a trip. What I wish there were a film about and what I would want to work on next in my own research are not the women, but actually the men. I think one group of people who've fallen through the cracks of our research on early, well, not early, but uh, late 19th, early 20th century African-Americans are that post reconstruction, pre-Harlem generation of black Southern ministers who really held down not only churches, but were foundational to the formation of the African-American schools, deeply involved in politics. Uh, the book that I'm working on now with Caroline Gebhardt, it's number six in the African-American Literature and Transition series begins with a story about one of these ministers. Uh, I'm not going to give it away. I know Caroline is probably on this Zoom and, 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 and pulling her hair out because we're going to keep it under wraps. But we did archival research for our introduction and found the story of an African-American Alabamian minister who is so much more after the Reconstruction and before World War I, so much more than a Black minister. He's really the de facto mayor of his town, putting together community, but also thinking about the posterity, also thinking about the next generation and the next generation building wealth, um, building employment opportunities. There's a story that needs to be told about these men, many of whom started newspapers in the South. And since we're currently in a moment <laughs> in the South, I've been more, more aware than ever before of what courage it took to speak truth to power 
in black Southern newspapers in the 1880s, the 1890s, and the 1900s. Yeah, I mean, there's a kind Painting of- Painting a toric target on your back. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of myth that starting with the great migration, all the black people in the South left. I mean, yes. it's ridiculous. Uh, and, yes. And if you were successful, um, why leave, right? I mean, you know, there were some people who left, but yes. more people never was the majority in the North. 90% of all black people in 1910 lived in the South, in the former Confederacy. And it never tilted to more than 50% uh, in the North. And now, of course, starting in 1970, reverse migration is, is taken. And I tell my students, Martin Luther King only left the South to go to BU to get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I come from a family one side of which takes great pride. Yeah. But in, in never having left the South. Never. Yeah, no. And Individuals there were a lot that of left. Who never left right. the South. And, right. You know, some ministers followed their congregations and some professionals, but overwhelmingly, the Black middle class in the South stayed in the South. Yeah. It's very proud of that and very yes. resentful of, you know, um, being mocked or looked down upon by the or, or people acting as if we need to be saved. We're saving ourselves. We always yeah. have. We no, always have. True. One reason I'm attracted to subjects like the crafts is that they come back. They come back to the South. Right. Uh, there's a civil rights uh, lawyer. His name is uh, not lawyer, reporter. Uh, his name escapes me. He was one of the major reporters for the Pittsburgh Courier. And he loved going south and reporting on uh, 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 these mock trials that white supremacists would hold in order to take land from people and, and kill people that they were threatened by, business people. And once he was asked, why do you do it? Why do you go to these southern cities? You know you have a target on your back. He didn't, he didn't hide. He would go into courthouses, take no, et cetera. And his response was, I go to where the fight is. And mm -hmm. I that mantra and i think it's going to be the title of my next book i have the mm -hmm. title of the book this is where the fight is that's great if you, if you ask if you ask if you get to know black southerners and you ask us you, you go into this conversation with us and you ask us why do you you know why are you beating your heads against the wall generation after generation two steps forward a thousand steps back <laughs> right now we're in the middle of a Big time ballot steal. You know, there's 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 one steal, one conversation about one steal, and now here another conversation altogether about a steal. Why do we stay? This is where the fight is. Yeah, it's and it's home. The fight is. It it's is home. It is Abby, home. You defend your home. That's right. Abby? Yep. Um, Cheryl Jilks just added to that, responded to that, that the largest percentage that lived in the North was 48%. So more, you know, yes. more stayed than left. And she said successful, successful folks um, who left often left on the threat of death. So this. Yes, exactly. This is, this is the kind of person that ended up at the Stanford's home for mm -hmm. girls. Um, many of those African American women knew that if they stayed a day longer, they were not going to survive. Uh, it wasn't just about not finding jobs or being fearful of sexual predation. It was because they understood the perceived threat in their success. So yeah, they left. Yeah. Um, here's another question. We've got a couple of uh, specific detail questions, which I think, and it's so wonderful to hear you tell these stories that um, these are questions that sometimes I think, oh, they're too specific, but I don't think that's the case here. Um, Zebulon Maletsky asks, says this was phenomenal and thanks you. Um, he says, do you think that um, W.M. Trotter might have included some of this in The Guardian because of his ties, I believe through marriage to the Kraft family and how might that have figured in if at all? Okay, so included, included some of the stories that I'm telling about the crafts or- I assume so, I mean, if he wants to- Right, what, what I can say that I didn't uh, include in this uh, presentation, but is in the book, is that uh, Trotter is connected, of course, by marriage to the crafts. He also is connected by friendship or Friendship is probably not the word. Association is the word. Mm -hmm. He's 
connected by association to Peter Thomas Stanford. Peter Thomas Stanford arranged his life so that he rubbed shoulders with the African-American Boston elites. He mm -hmm. tried to get on every board. He was a willing worker. He did the work, but he was on every board. He was in all the societies that he could enter. He was peripatetic even in his ability to, to, to give sermons at churches. He was a Baptist by training, but he pastored Congregationalist churches in that area. He was quite versatile and he was building a network. He was very uh, intentional about building a network of socially connected people who could help promote his writing and his labors. And he also was politically committed. So he admired William Monroe Trotter and they worked together on various projects to assist different groups of black men employed in Boston for example, helping African-American waiters to negotiate better wages. Uh, he was very involved with William Monroe Trotter to the extent, end of story, that when Stanford died, it is Trotter who gives his eulogy. And Trotter's eulogy is magnificent. Uh, it's in the archive. Um, we talk about it in our book. So Trotter, being a newspaper man, knew a lot of folk. Mm -hmm. It's no surprise that he interacted with Stanford. Were they friends? I hesitate to use that word because we have no evidence that they interacted socially. But we have plenty of evidence that they interacted professionally. They interacted politically. They were both deeply committed to education. And it is Trotter who, after Stanford dies, gives one of Stanford's textbooks in honor of Stanford to one of the uh, libraries, Woburn, Massachusetts Library, public library. So Trotter uh, had uh, Stanford as well as the crafts on his radar. This is such a, um, the kind of a subtext of a, of a history of Massachusetts too. I mean, movement yes. and mobility within Massachusetts. So I used to live right off of Dudley Street, by the way. So when you said Dudley Street, I- Small world, small <laughs> world. Um, so uh, Susanna Ashton, who is one of our current fellows, um, says, this is wonderful. So many twists and turns. One small question. Could you mm -hmm. please explain again briefly, she says, Kraft's connection to the Healy family of Georgia and Maine. You mentioned it quickly. Yes. Wow, that's a great question. And I'd like to congratulate Susanna, whom I've met and who's a wonderful scholar of 19th century African Americans and a great researcher in her own right in the archives. Uh, thank you for that question, Susanna. Wow. The relationship is both historical and murky. Uh, there have been several books written about the Healy's. Uh, many of the children of Michael and Eliza went on to fame. One becomes an Arctic explorer. Another, perhaps the most well-known and perhaps the one that Suzanne is thinking about becomes an important um, church uh, official. Uh, boy, but when you start moving backwards in time, it's very challenging to actually connect the dots and find out just how the crafts get connected to the Healy's. There is a journalist who published about a year ago an article on Michael Healy's children. And Susanna, if you email me, I can send it to you. And that journalist is the one who made the insight that Ellen's mother's sister, who was named Eliza, was in the household of the Healy. And in that regard, that is where the Crafts connection, at least Ellen's connection, begins with the Healy family. More than that, I do not know. Uh, and this was a newspaper article, not a book. Uh, but it was well documented. I corresponded with the journalist. Um, and it's true. Uh, her sister, her mother's sister, was in the Healy household. So that would be the place to begin. 
Uh, scholars just have not gone that far back. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing the work that I'm doing now on Clinton. We all like to talk about the craft story as beginning in Macon. And, and in a way it does. That's where their escape begins from Georgia in Macon. Hands down, uh, no question. But Ellen lived at least 11 years prior to that in Clinton. And the more I do research on Clinton, the more I understand that it is significant to think about Clinton in relationship to forming not only her personality, but the kinds of relationships that she would enter later in life as a young woman and as an adult in England and then coming back to the United States. It's also just a fascinating place. Who knew that Clinton, Georgia was one of the most important cities in Georgia in the 19th century? It's a sleepy little, it's a bedroom community now, right? Dwarfed, as I mentioned, by Macon. And then of course, Atlanta, which came along a little later, is the city. It is Gotham. It is the metropolis. But in the 1820s and 30s, the center of the state where Macon and Clinton and Gray now are, is the center of Georgia. And it's interesting to contemplate what that means for someone like Ellen to come out of slavery. Mm -hmm. Can on the, the topic, my, my, oh, the short answer to my question, the short answer uh, that I'm giving to Susanna's question is that there are many more questions about the Healy's and the Crafts than uh, um, uh, indefensible, well, than undisputable facts. There's a lot of research to be done about that. Mm -hmm. um, as a follow up to that, I also missed something that I was hoping you might um, either repeat or expand on. The, and I'm sorry, I was busy taking notes on other things that I missed. Sure. It, the connection to J. Marion Sims, if you could just talk about that, because the reason yes. I kind of perked up at that point, because also we in the fall, we're doing an exhibition in our Rudenstein Gallery on um, works of art representing, you know, the four mothers of gynecology were, pro we right. hopefully are working with Michelle Browder to some degree. So excellent. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, make sure. sure that I had that connection straight. Right. I want to clarify, there is no direct connection between Dr. At least none that I know between Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Sims. I introduced Dr. Sims because he is more well known yeah. And I wanted to provide some context. Certainly Dr. Hamilton was sadistic and monstrous, but by connecting him to Sims, I wanted to call attention to how not unusual this kind of experimentation was. Mm -hmm. That's the point that I am making. Mm -hmm. Sims or, or, or Hamilton, they are not uh, uh, deviants. Uh, there's, a, there's a consistency around exploiting African-American bodies in myriads of ways besides putting them in the fields or placing them in the big house as cooks and laundresses, et cetera. And I wanted to call attention to the wonderful work that is being done by scholars like Washington on this kind of medical experimentation that traces back to slavery. So the connection is not literal, it's textual just trying to provide context to demonstrate that it, in some ways what I, am, what I am saying is that Clinton is a microcosm of many towns, many cities in the American South in the 30s and the 20s that have thrived because of slavery. Mm -hmm. And that really is the bottom line for Clinton. Mm -hmm. It is a cotton town in the 1820s and 30s ringed by these plantations um, which are providing enormous amounts of wealth because of the labor that can be done uncompensated by African Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is trying to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to think about when um, Ellen Craft disguised her, you know, both race and gender, and then moving forward a few decades. Carolyn, but you know what you're calling the lush life or was you know very glamorous. I mean, yes. just the way they kind of owned their own bodies in that yes. way. Yes, that's a wonderful way of putting it. Of um, 
of having their bodies exploited or the bodies of their foremothers exploited and forefathers. And my point is, that's a wonderful way of putting it, owning their own bodies, but also understanding that even though slavery has passed for Carolyn and at least for the last third of her life for Ellen, also understanding that in many ways they can't, they still can't own their own bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are compelled to use their bodies in different ways in order to succeed, mm -hmm. to try to succeed on their terms rather than on society's terms. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what passing is about for so many African Americans. Carolyn, it's understanding that this might not be the ideal way of expressing oneself, um, not authentic, but it is an opportunity to take back, as you pointed out, Abby, your own body. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, um, just, I think we're kind of winding down and just that, that feels, it, there's always that moment where it feels like that's a perfect closing <laughs> statement, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that you would like to leave us with today. We, we heard a lot of names, some were familiar. I mean, the number yes. of names, um, yes. just the intersections of all of these people yes. some of whom we've heard of some we haven't is quite right. something, but I'm wondering you know, what else you would like us to take with us as we yes. await the publication of this work? Uh, thank you for that question. What I would like, uh, particularly the emergent scholars on the line to consider, because my career really, the most fulfilling moments of my career, hands down, have been my work with my students and emergent scholars. What I would like them to take away is something that I'm, 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 I'm borrowing from John Ernest, who wrote a wonderful essay about this very idea that individuals are important, of course, when we start to recover African American history. We want to stay tuned to the names that we didn't recognize and find out who they are, like Carolyn Stanford and Michael and Eliza Healy. But we have to remember that they were in community and it's not enough to tell their stories without thinking about what was the context of the communities in which they lived and in what ways did they attempt to build community? How do we create a methodology for talking about communities? Because as John Ernest rightly points out, in the communities we find names like Eliza Healy. We're never, never, uh, likely never, right, going to find an archive for Eliza Healy. But we can learn more about her life through how she interacted in community. And specifically, I mean how she interacted, how William Monroe Trotter interacted, how Reverend Stanford, how Ellen Craft and William Craft interacted in the organizations that they belonged to, in the organizations that they founded in the projects they created, like William and Ellen Craft School. How do they create community? And what does that community building tell us, not only about them as individuals, but as African Americans as a people? Mm -hmm. When I was a graduate student, I remember, and you know, that was a long time ago. <laughs> when I was a graduate student some 30 years ago, I remember many of my fellow graduate students being incredulous about my decision to study slavery. Uh, I remember specifically one person accosting me on the steps of Emory University's library and asking me why I wanted to study all those whips and chains and mm -hmm. maybe I needed some help. <laughs> and uh, okay, so why do I study slavery? Because for me, it's not about the pain. It's not about the division, although certainly there was much of that. It's not about the hopelessness. It's not about the, 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 the existential threat that slavery created. It's about how people not only survived in it, but thrived in it because they did. That is the extraordinary, extraordinary story that I'm trying to tell. Because remember, the majority of enslaved people, African-Americans enslaved in the American South, did not escape. 
No, the overwhelming they didn't majority. They the didn't escape. That's why I'm here, right? Yeah. They didn't escape. So we know that it was difficult and challenging on a lot of levels to escape. But that fact tells me something. What kept them there? Those communities that they created when they weren't supposed to create communities, the families they created when they weren't supposed to create families. Talk about enslaved people as resilient, but I like to talk about enslaved people as creative and innovative because how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you laugh? How do you find joy? And I like to think of Carolyn motoring in the New Jersey back roads. And she used to wear this little jockey outfit. I like to think of her finding some joy in that. You know, stopping trains. Carolyn, when she's sitting in a theater in London in a ball gown, everyone's looking at her. Not Carolyn, Ellen, when she's sitting in a theater in London watching her friend Ira Allridge perform on the stage. Mm -hmm. And everyone else is looking at her and thinking black woman and looking at him and thinking black man and, and wondering how do they do it? How do they do it? And they know that the answer to that question is never going to be spoken and no one's ever going to steal their juice. That's why I study slavery. Oh, that's brilliant. I study slavery. You know you got to make a transcript of, of this <laughs> and put those as epigraphs mm -hmm. to your uh, <laughs> to your book. I mean, really, it's very beautiful. And it's well, I'm waiting for UGA to give me a gold watch or you know <laughs> something for thirty. We don't we don't have that kind of ritual at our university, and that's got to change because thirty years is something. Mm -hmm. No, we we, we are we get, we get watches and we get chairs. You know, See? I mean, wooden chairs, but uh, yes, but no, no, that, the, I have this. This is my legacy, and I really no, no, the, the, being able to share it. No, the life of the race is still buried in the archives, and its story collectively remains to be told. There are so many undiscovered stories that will make yes a younger person's career or an older person. Yes, slavery just, is inspiring. The era of um, American slavery can yeah. be inspiring. It doesn't have to be a slog through torture and terror. That's there. No, but you know, I am. In a, world, in a world that we live in today that is dangerous, that is violent, we can learn lessons about how to center joy in that. I think to do this is very contemporary and very relevant and needs more so now than ever yeah we may not you know we're not you know we're not in coffles or all of that but our lives are challenging and, no, and the, the story of how our enslaved ancestors um kept their families together as best they could and replicated mm -hmm. so that you know there were there are only 388,000 Africans who came directly from Africa to North America, and another 42,000 came to the intra-American slave trade. Mm -hmm. And in the 1860 census, there are 4.4 million African Americans. I mean, the, our ancestors just multiplied, and they worshiped God, and they created the spirituals, and a zillion That's other- That's genius. That is know, genius. genius. And collard greens. <laughs> 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 and, you know, out of nothing. Yes, out of, out of nothing. And it's a, it's a story that begs to be told, and we have to yes. keep going. I love it. I, it's like that old day. I love to tell the story, you know? Yes. <laughs> and I love the, the stories of, of African Americans, anonymous African Americans. I have a game that I play with scholars off the record, historians. You know, we're literary historians, but, you know, quote unquote, real historians, as they would say. <laughs> and I would say, how many people really escaped on the Underground Railroad? And you know what? I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I've never had. <laughs> you can guess who I've had. I can guess. And they say at best 25,000. But they don't want to say that because they're yes. afraid they're going to be canceled because, you know, the estimates are the Underground Railroad Museum says 100,000. And nobody believes that that's true, much as no. I admire yes. the work 
right. at the Freedom Museum in Cincinnati. You mm -hmm. think about it, if it was all that easy to escape, slavery would have collapsed. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and and and, um, and 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 even more important, there were African Americans who were enslaved, who could have escaped and didn't. Sure. And I'm curious about those stories. Well, what, think about it this way: What are you going to do? Go to Philadelphia, New York, or Boston and be homeless? And exactly. you know, there's no social services. Exactly. Um, and all of these cities talked about the black poor and the problems of free Negroes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a uh, uh, you know, no crystal stair, as uh, Langston would, would, would say, being free in the North. It was much better to be free than not. But um, here's another uh, astonishing fact, which I know you know. But in 1860, there are 488,000 free people of color. 262, more than 50%, lived in the slave states and stayed in the slave states, that includes the border states, during the Civil War. That's astonishing. There were more free Negroes in the South than mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the North. That mm -hmm. is amazing to me. This is home. And what makes it home, this is where we've created community. And emphasis on the create. Uh, this has been the fulcrum for our genius and will continue to be. And Herbal this McCaskill. is, this is where you, the fight is. Y'all come down. <laughs> I will, I will. Thank you, Professor. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. That was fun. Boy, thank I wish so I could much. have seen the audience, but that's okay. They're sending well, your, their love. I will, I will say to the audience members, any additional questions, please feel free. Uh, I'm, like, if you could share my email in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Please feel free to send me any questions. I'll answer them. It's a crunch time right now. Uh, <laughs> graduate students dissertations but i'll answer them as quickly as i can for you all be mccask i <laughs> be mccask i just some terrible you know i'm not creative when it comes to email addresses uh no that's great i think it's yes. creative all Please right good feel night. Free. thank Have you so day. much Member, dr gates um ms wolf thank you so much thank dr you. gates when did you ever call me dr gates <laughs> dr gates is my brother <laughs> I'm trying to model. I'm trying to model professional etiquette here to my. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Hey, I'm trying to model it. So give me a break here. Thank Excuse you. Uh, Abby, thank you, Doctor. Bye bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Bravo.